Happy Tuesday, everyone. We're going to um, let everyone trickle into our room from the waiting room and other areas. While we do that, I um, just wanted to introduce myself, Leslie Cockrell at the Center for Excellence and Disabilities at uh, West Virginia University. Um, we're very appreciative that you're able to join us for our November Grand Rounds, uh, Ability Ground Rounds um, speaker today. Uh, very excited that he's joining us um, internationally. So, um, and, I, and I believe we are going into an area that, as, as Melinda's mentioned earlier, that is up and coming here locally for us in West Virginia, as well as states. Um, but he's done some work, considerable work from where he is, and he's gonna tell us a little bit about it today. So um, Dr. Lorenzo Rum is our speaker. And before we uh, get to him, I do want to go over a few housekeeping items. Remember to mute your line. Um, don't use me as a model. I have a loud background and I'm gonna mute myself here in a second, uh, but be sure to mute your line. Please utilize the chat for questions. Um, and then we're gonna have some time toward the end for questions and discussion. Please join us for that. Again, we love it when it's a very interactive discussion. Presenters love it. I'm sure Dr. Rum would love it. And um, please do that. Uh, the other thing is raise your hand or use some of the functions on the Zoom. Let us know if you have any questions or issues. So with that, Melina, how does it look? Ready for introductions? Or? Yep, I think we're ready to go. Wonderful. Okay, so Dr. Lorenzo Rum is joining us. He's a research fellow at the Department of Movement, Human, and Health Sciences at the University of Rome. Um, and so, like I said, it's, he's joining us internationally, obviously, and it is eight o'clock his time. We're very appreciative of him taking that time to teach us a little bit about what he's been doing. And today in particular, wearable technology in Paralympic sports. With that, Dr. Rum, I'll turn it over to you and thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the nice introduction and welcome everyone. And thank you for being here and join us. And in this Italian evening, actually, because uh, it's like 8 p.m. In, in Italy. But um, yeah, as you can tell, maybe from, from the lights. So I will um, just uh, start with uh, a little yeah, introduction about myself. As Dr. Cottrell say, I'm a research fellow in the Laboratory of Bioengineering and Neuromechanics of Movement at the University of Rome for Italico. And today I will um, talk about um, the, the work I've been done uh, during the last uh, three, four years in, uh, in Paralympic sports and uh, the use of different uh, wearable technologies in uh, Paralympic sports. And uh, so just uh, to give you very uh, fast overview of the presentation today, I will provide some context about uh, Paralympic sports, uh, what, uh, we, what sports discipline we do have in the Paralympic uh, context, what's the role of biomechanics and uh, more uh, specifically sports biomechanics in Paralympic sports and what we can do in, with these uh, biomechanics uh, to help uh, both athletes and um, and coaches and everyone who works with uh, every professional uh, who works in the field and of course the main topic of the of this uh, lecture will be what kind of uh, application we have uh, by using uh, uh, different types of wearable sensors so just to start uh, I will as you can see here, we do have a lot of different types of sports discipline, summer uh, sports and winter sports in the Paralympic sports context. And uh, among them, uh, we, we can find like different types of individual uh, sports. So for example, archery, athletics, badminton, or um, we can find also um, sports, uh, team sports. So basically, uh, or wheelchair-based uh, team sports, so for example, wheelchair basketball, fencing, uh, rugby, and tennis. So when we deal with uh, Paralympic athletes, we can find in uh, each of the different sports disciplines, 
different types of uh, uh, disabilities and related impairments. So we can find athletes who are amputees. So for example, transtibial amputees, transfemoral amputees, uh, or also, of course, upper limb amputees, but also different types of uh, disabilities. So for example, people with uh, spinal cord injury, people who has a uh, short stature, or also uh, not really physical types of impairments. So we can find also visual and intellectual types of impairments. So as you might guess, when we find to, uh, in a Paralympic sports, to compete all these different types of uh, impairments, the main goal uh, of the organization who try to, um, to establish a fairness uh, into the competition is to try to develop a system which can, of course, ensure the fairness in competition. So let different athletes with different types of uh, disability to compete together, but don't letting the, um, the impairment uh, affect the sports performance. So in order to make it, uh, make the game fair, the um, Paralympic context has developed uh, a, a classification process. So each Paralympic sports or para sports has his uh, own unique system to classify athletes. And uh, the basic role of classification is, first of all, to define the eligibility of the athletes in order to compete in the specific Paralympic sports. And uh, of course, then uh, to group them, so to group the athletes in different sport classes according to the level of their impairment to minimize the impact that the impairment itself has on uh, the sport performance and uh, therefore to determine that um, the sport in excellence is the is what determine the the victory of the athletes and not the level of the uh, impairment so how this classification works the first step of course each uh, sports each sports discipline has its own uh, eligible impairment list and uh, as I said before, we can find different types of uh, physical impairments. Among them, we can find like impair uh, muscle power, limb deficiency, leg length, uh, leg length difference, and different types of neurological disorders. But also, as I said before, uh, visual types and intellectual types of impairments. So once we do have a list for each sports of eligible impairments, what is done is uh, um, an evaluation of the, of the athletes and the level of his impairment, according to, of course, the medical reports that, um, prove, that prove the level of the impairment and the type, of course, of, of the impairment, but also with uh, physical tests, which can, uh, of course, provide some uh, quantitative, quantitative measurements of the level of the impairment. Then once all these evaluation process is done, uh, the athletes is allocated to different sport classes and the number of sport classes differs among the different, uh, uh, different sports disciplines. So for example, here uh, in uh, standing uh, Nordic uh, skiing, we can find like eight different types of classes or sports classes for uh, people who had lost the function of uh, both legs or arms. So what happened in the last, uh, I would say, uh, 10 years or so is that um, there was a call to uh, create an evidence-based classification system in each sports discipline. So basically is to develop a classification uh, uh, procedure or process which is based on different class sports classes profiles and also uh, evaluation methods which are based on uh, uh, scientific evidence and of course which of course validate the uh, class classification methodologies which are employed during the evaluation process 
in order that, of course, um, to to restate, I would restate the the first aim of classification, of course, to that is to reduce the um, the impact that the different types of impairment have on uh, on a given sports performance, and um, of course to allocate uh, athletes with different types of impairment, but that have the same amount of difficulty in performing the sport action, which is of course specific to each sport. And uh, the IPC, the International Paralympic Committee, actually provided uh, different types of steps to develop an evidence-based classification system, which is uh, composed by three different phases. The first one, the development uh, phase, uh, which is basically to, um, to identify first the, the sports discipline and one single type of impairment. And based on these, to develop um, a model of uh, determinants of sports performance. So to understand what which factors are um, important for the specific sports performance. And as a third step within this phase is to develop from one side, measure, of course, valid, scientifically valid measures of uh, impairment, but also at the same time, the, uh, to develop the valid measurements of uh, the determinants of performance, which can be, of course, biomechanical, neurological, neuromuscular, and so on. So once all these uh, steps are done, uh, we can uh, implement what, um, what is provided by, by the science, by, by research, and to translate what, is, what has been discovered into um, the, the policies that regulate uh, sports competition within the specific uh, uh, Paralympic sports. So we have this translational phase in which we implement what we know through research into uh, in order to to get changes into the classification systems, so we provide, for example, new systems of sport classes, so different types of sport classes or different types of measurements uh, which are employed during the athlete evaluation process, and of course, then a third phase, the last phase, which is the monitoring phase. Um, in which we uh, periodically evaluate uh, um, the effects of these uh, new classification system. And uh, if needed, we can uh, provide some changes to, to this new classification system by going to back to the first phase. So we go back to the development phase, we repeat all the steps in order to provide um, more, valid, more valid types of measurements and a more valid classification system as well. So of course, we, um, when we uh, consider the role of sports biomechanics and what sports biomechanists can do in this context, we are of course in the uh, develop development phase and specifically in the step uh, uh, three, I would say, and, uh, and two. So, uh, of course, we need to validate different types of measurement. And uh, to validate different types of measurement, we need science, research, and of course, sport biomechanics. Uh, biomechanics is, plays a key role within this context. So just to provide a very big overview of what uh, sports biomechanics or biomechanics in general can do within uh, Paralympic sports, of course, what we can do is to measure, as I said before, is we can do measurements of different types um, of uh, factors which can describe the, the movement we want to analyze. So for example, we can measure kinematics, which basically is uh, uh, different, uh, for example, joint angles during the movement, but also kinetics, so the forces which are um, exerted during the movement, but also uh, to we can measure and assess and analyze the muscle activity which is produced during uh, uh, the sports action. 
So what we can do with all these types of, of measurements is, and what are the applications of these type of measurements are, of course, uh, to optimize the technique that is uh, performed by the, by the athletes. So we can provide, for example, measurements of joint angles to, uh, to the athletes or to the coaches to uh, improve their technique, to optimize to their technique in order to uh, um, improve their performance. But also, once we know that there are some uh, biomechanical factors that can uh, uh, lead to injuries during, the, during sports activities, we can use also these measurements to um, measure these quantities in order to prevent uh, the, um, the risk of injury in the, in the future for the athletes. So for example, if we know that um, a movement of the shoulder joint is too much and is too risky and uh, over time can lead to, um, to injuries, to overuse injuries, for example, we can monitor, uh, assess and measure the, the, um, the shoulder joint with different types of sensors. And I will show you then uh, what, what type of sensor we can, we can uh, use in order to, of course, as I said, to prevent injury. But there are some, while these two types of applications or so technique optimization and injury prevention can be applied to uh, sports, in general, so not only sports uh, with people uh, with uh, for people with uh, with disabilities, there are two types of application which are really specific to persons uh, with disability and, of course, uh, to Paralympic sports, which are uh, the application of biomechanics uh, to uh, for, of course, the evidence-based classification, as I said before, but also for the optimization of uh, uh, assistive te technology. So in the first case for evidence-based classification application, we can, uh, uh, for example, uh, we can measure uh, what types of biomechanical properties are related to the type of the impairment and how they change according to the level of the impairment. And we can provide this information in order to, for example, um, to implement in this knowledge within uh, the sports classes uh, system. So for example, if we can identify some kind of uh, threshold, we can uh, of course divide the, the subject, the, 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 the athletes into different sports classes because that type of measurements is um, discriminative of the level of the impairment. But also we can, uh, of course, use um, biomechanics and all the measure biomechanical measurements to, um, to assess the level of um, uh, customization of, uh, of the assistive, te assistive uh, technology. So for example, we can look at how a different type of prosthesis can change the biomechanics of running for example, in uh, uh, running athletes. And uh, once we get this information, we can change and optimize the prosthesis according to the, the information we get from uh, these biomechanical assessments. So what type of instrumentation we do have uh, in order to obtain these biomechanical measurements? If you are lucky enough and you have uh, you work in a, in a biomechanical um, laboratory, you might find uh, these different types of uh, instrumentations. So, for example, motion capture system, which are based on uh, stereophotogrammetry and basically can reconstruct, as you can see here in uh, the bottom figure, they can reconstruct uh, uh, the motion of the different body segments of the subject of the person and of course obtain all the different biomechanical measurements uh, i said before so kinematics but also kinetics <clears throat> also we can find within this laboratory uh, force plates we can measure the ground reaction forces which are exerted by the the, the person uh, 
against the ground. So for example, here on the right, you can see um, a person with a prosthesis and uh, on uh, an instrumented uh, treadmill, which has some uh, force plates built in it. Uh, and they can measure, of course, the, the, the forces which are exchanged by from the subject, uh, between the subject and the floor. But also we can find, of course, electromyographical devices to measure muscle activity and, uh, as I said, instrumented uh, treadmills. But what we have when we want to move to the field and measure the, the biomechanical properties of both the athletes, but also the uh, assistive technology they use directly where the sports action are performed. So first of all, uh, uh, we do have video analysis. So for example, by using uh, sports action cameras uh, or action cameras, we can uh, record the image and also we can analyze images through different types of, uh, of uh, software which are available and also open source. But of course, they are not really, uh, they are quite time consuming because a part of recording the image, you need, of course, to, to analyze the image through these different softwares and it takes, of course, time. Another type of sensors, uh, we, we can find that there are uh, the inertia sensors, which basically can measure both acceleration, linear acceleration, and uh, angular velocity, but also GPS systems and again EMG devices, which are uh, becoming wireless uh, and uh, they can be used, of course, in field in certain condition. So, what we uh, the the advantage of using these type of technologies directly in field is that we can obtain for uh, the methodology. We, we want to validate an ecological validity. Ecological validity, it means that, of course, the, the validation of uh, these different type of measurement system is performed within uh, the context, the real life context in which, as I said before, the sports action are performed. So they, they gain um, a greater validity compared to the test that can be used in the lab uh, from this point of view. So when uh, uh, speaking about ecological validity, we came across, of course, um, wearable type of sensors, and uh, we can find different types of wearable sensors. And uh, today I will uh, show you only those sensors which are used uh, to analyze movement. So as I said, we can find like um, inertial types of sensors, but also electrogoniometers, which can provide uh, um, joint angles. Also um, activity trackers, which have uh, some accelerometers in it and can, uh, for example, through different use, through different um, algorithms, they can provide uh, different types of information. For example, the steps count but also um, we can uh, measure um, different uh, kinematic uh, types of uh, information, so related to forces. And for example, we can find pressure insoles, but also pressure mats uh, in the use of, uh, with um, person with uh, wheelchair users. And again, as I said before, among these types of wearable sensors, we can find also wireless EMG, which can measure, again, the muscle activity, and also G GPS trackers, which are highly used in uh, sports, team sports to track and monitor the movement uh, of the athletes uh, within the field. So just... Um, to go to our work, my work and uh, uh, the work from, uh, from my laboratory, we did um, a systematic review a couple of years ago, uh, last year, uh, on the use, of course, of wearable sensors in, uh, in sports for person with disability. And uh, today I will show you and I will share with you some of the knowledge we, we gather with this, within this uh, review. So, 
the first step is that uh, when looking at the research that uh, employed different types of wearable sensors in Paralympic sports, we, um, we know that the most investigated sports are wheelchair-based sports. Uh, so for example, we found that wheelchair basketball, rugby and racing were the highest, the highly, uh, the most investigated sports. And uh, among all these different types of uh, Paralympic sports discipline, we can find different, um, the, the use of different types of uh, wearable sensors. And uh, the most used uh, sensors were inertial sensor and ENG, but um, most other studies also used uh, four sensors, pressure mats, as I said, digital ergonometers, and uh, a GPS and also heart rate, which not really provide biomechanical, I would say a biomechanical assessment of the of the athlete's performance. It's it's more is more physiological information, but still it can be considered a, a wearable sensor. And of course, as I anticipated, different types of uh, application. Uh, of these wearable sensors were um, for athletes classification, so for the, um, the development of evidence-based classification system, for the characterization of performance, so for the definition of what types of uh, uh, factors are uh, determinant of performance, but also for uh, injury prevention and again, equipment customization. Just to give you really um, an idea of what can be the use of uh, these different types of sensors within these different types of application, I will um, present you the results of one study per each uh, application, just to give you like an insight on uh, um, what type of use we can, uh, we can do with, uh, with these type of sensors. So the first one, uh, the first example is uh, an application uh, for athletes classification. So uh, the aim of, um, of this study was to develop a new uh, field test for measuring uh, trunk stability in wheelchair basketball uh, classification for wheelchair basketball classification. And uh, the main uh, idea uh, of the authors was of course to provide a valid, a valid methodology to um, discriminate the different types of, um, of impairment of wheelchair basketball athletes according to their performance uh, in, uh, in trunk stability. So of course the aim uh, was to validate, validate an objective and portable measure of trunk function for wheelchair basketball classification. So in order to do so, they uh, recruited uh, both athletes um, with and without disability. And uh, they um, asked the, these, these athletes to perform uh, different, um, different types of pushes against uh, uh, a wall, pushes and, uh, and also pulleys. And uh, they measured they measured the force that was exerted by the athlete uh, uh, against the wall or by pulling the um, by, by pulling um, towards the, the the chest. And they used uh, force sensors, which are called uh, force gauge gauges, and also uh, EMG sensor to measure, of course, the the activity. Or different types of, uh, of muscle, which were erector spina, so back muscles, but also abdominal muscle, pe pectoral muscle, and also the rectus family, rectus femoris muscle, which is the, uh, the leg muscle. And uh, of course, again, uh, among the parameters they uh, measured was, of course, the peak force, which was exerted uh, against the wall. But also they develop uh, a score, a trunk stability score, 
which was based, of course, on, uh, on the force measurements. And uh, finally, they also measure uh, the EMG activation, the peak EMG activation during uh, the, the pushes and the pulleys. And uh, here, they, uh, these are some of the results they gained, they obtained during the tests. And uh, what they observed was that the, the people uh, with this ability basically uh, produce similar amount of forces compared to people without disabilities. Um, and of course, in both groups, we, they found uh, the greatest force production in the forward direction. So where the, the athletes were pulling, were, pulling, were pushing against uh, the wall. But also when uh, they removed this, the back support, they found out that, of course, people with, uh, with disability showed the greater loss of force compared to people without disability. Because of course, when removing the support, the, the person is not, uh, the person with disability is not able to, to leverage against the, 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 the support. So um, inevitably uh, they, they, they observe the greater loss of force in this population. But it, what is uh, most interesting is when uh, looking at the EMG activation, and especially in the, uh, in the bottom left, they found that the mean activation peak of the rectus femoris during the pushing task, so against uh, uh, the wall, was, um, was different, was changing in uh, people uh, without disabilities. So when, uh, when removing the, the, the support, when removing the support, the activation of the leg muscle was reduced. Why in the people without disability? While in the people with disability, it basically remained the same. So with these results, they were able, the authors were able to uh, gain some insights on the role of back support, not only in the upper part of the body, so uh, on the muscle activity of the, of the upper body, but how it changes in the lower body as well. So just to provide really um, fast feedback about the conclusion of the sports, the hatters say that um, individuals with disability lose uh, the greatest, um, a greater percentage of force when, uh, of course, the back support is removed and the aid of the back support is removed. And this is the first step uh, to say that this type of, uh, of test is at least able to discern differences in the lack of trunk stability. So, of course, in people with disability, we have a lack or a reduced trunk stability. And this type of test was able to provide some uh, objective measurement of this uh, reduced trunk stability. But also, um, while um, although, although EMG was similar between groups in, at upper body level, <clears throat> um, the observation of uh, muscle activity at lower limbs, at lower limbs was able to discover some uh, muscle activation strategy, which are specific to the, to, to the, to the population with uh, the, this type of disabilities. And uh, of course, the claim, the final claim of, of the, the, the authors was that more, um, more athletes, larger sample sizes are needed and are required. And especially um, more athletes with different types of, uh, of uh, impairment. Um, in terms of greater functional loss are required in order to determine uh, whether this type of test is able to really stratify uh, Paralympic athletes, wheelchair, wheelchair basketball athletes based on uh, their level of disability. So this was um, an example of how uh, wearable sensors and uh, specifically EMG and uh, uh, force sensors are used um, for athletes classification. The next example I want to um, share with you is how we can uh, 
characterize the performance. So how we can measure um, some of the factors which are thought uh, to be determinant for the performance outcome. And uh, in the, and specifically, uh, we will shift to the swimming, Paralympic swimming context. So from wheelchair basketball to swimming. And uh, these, in this study, the authors uh, used uh, inertial sensors to um, validate to validate a new system which is able to count the number of peak of kick or leg kick during uh, freestyle, and not only to count but also to provide a frequency information, so a rate of the kick count. And this was because, um, of course, the main uh, problem, the main issue with, uh, with most of the coaches is that they use uh, a visual information to describe uh, the, the athlete's performance and the athlete's uh, motor action, which can be, of course, uh, most of the time is, uh, can be accurate. So we need this type of measurements, this type of uh, um, technology to uh, provide to provide to the coaches, to the athletes, but also to sports scientists or other types of professional, uh, some measure, measures that are sport specific, but also valid and reliable. So of course, also here, the aim was to validate a measurement system, which was based on inertial sensor technology, uh, as I said, to uh, assess and to um, monitor the kick count and uh, rate of uh, Paralympic swimmers. To do so, um, there were uh, 12 participants, 12 uh, uh, Paralympic swimmers were recruited. And as you can see here, um, different types of uh, disabilities were included. So for example, we had um, athletes with cerebral palsy, but also leg and uh, arm amputees. So what uh, the, uh, these athletes did during the study was to perform uh, two sprints, two 100 meter uh, sprints in uh, freestyle, in both freestyle swimming technique and kicking only swimming technique. And uh, of course, in order to measure the reliability of the measurement system across different sessions, the, they were asked to perform these tests in uh, three different sessions. Uh, each one was uh, with uh, five weeks apart. So the equipment they used was, uh, as I said, uh, inertial sensor. Um, and uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, uh, in these type of sensors include accelerometers, which can uh, measure acceleration, linear acceleration in the three axes. Of the, of the sensor, but also uh, a gyroscope, which is able to provide uh, the angular velocity. So the velocity at which uh, uh, the angles are changes, changes over time. <clears throat> and of course, they used an underwater video for, uh, for checking, for double checking the information they were providing, that uh, they were um, giving from, uh, they were provided by the sensor. For the parameters they assessed, um, of course, the kick count and the kick rate, but they used uh, a specific algorithm. They developed a specific algorithm to detect the, the, the kick, because of course they, they wanted to provide to the coaches and the athletes uh, a, um, a tool which, was, which is able uh, uh, to give them, to provide them the direct information about the key count and the key rate. And how they did it, it was by um, using the information they provide, uh, that was provided uh, uh, by the gyroscope. So here in the plot, you can see the changes of the angular velocity of the, of the initial sensor, which was uh, um, placed on the thigh or uh, the shank of the, of the athletes. And uh, as you can see here, the, the signal is, the shape of the signal is very similar to a wave. 
which reflects, of course, the kicking movement. So it was quite easy to develop an algorithm which was uh, uh, automatically able to, um, to determine the start and the stop of each kick based on the down and up beat of the, of the signal. So uh, what, they, uh, what they found was that um, they found some differences between the different uh, swimming techniques. So for example, um, the estimates uh, of the kick count, which was obtained from the inertial sensor and the measurement system itself uh, for the swimming trials. So the, the freestyle swimming trials was substantially more variable than for the kicking count. The, the kicking uh, swimming style. And um, this is uh, like, for example, first information that um, provides us the information that maybe these uh, type of measurement system might be more suitable for kicking uh, uh, swimming technique more than the, um, the freestyle swimming uh, technique. But also within the swimming uh, uh, trials, so freestyle swimming uh, trials, the kick count uh, at the thigh segment was less variable than uh, the, the one at the shank. So when we position the, the inertial sensor at the thigh, the measurement system, when uh, uh, the, the sensor is positioned at the thigh, is less variable and more accurate than when the sensor is positioned at the shank. So in conclusion, um, the authors uh, declared that uh, a sufficient level of validity and reliability um, to quantify at least moderate to large uh, changes in the kink count and the rate in freestyle swimming was obtained, which of course lead to um, an implementation of this measurement system uh, uh, in athletes when they perform uh, a freestyle swimming technique. Of course, when we want to choose, when we, we can when we can choose the, the the placement, the location of where the, the, the sensor is placed, when the selecting the, the thigh of the leg is uh, preferable compared to the to the shank, because of course, as I said before, it provided uh, more accurate uh, estimates of the kick count. And uh, finally, of course, the coaches, the, the end users of the, the, this measurement system can, uh, of course, employ this technology to identify changes in the kick count and rate patterns uh, between the different training sessions because they obtain also high uh, rel reliability indexes. And uh, of course, they can use these since the, this methodology was reliable uh, over time and over different uh, session. It can be used and it can be very useful to be used uh, to detect these changes over prolonged uh, uh, time period. So, for example, between uh, not only training session, but also during the whole uh, uh, season. And uh, of course, this is um, available on the market. I wouldn't say the, the trend, but uh, you can find it in, um, in the paper if you, if you look or if you search on, uh, on PubMed. <clears throat> so um, one, uh, just going very quickly, um, another application of wearable sensor is to prevent injuries, as I said before. And uh, uh, in particular, the, the study I want to, to, to present um, provided some measurements of uh, pressures against the, the, the wheelchair seats in uh, wheelchair basketball players, because of course, this measurement is related uh, um, to injuries uh, such as uh, uh, pressure ulcers. So again, uh, the aim of this study was to evaluate the association between uh, um, not only the configuration of the wheelchair, so for example, the different types of seat, uh, of the backrest, uh, but also uh, some uh, personal uh, factors, <clears throat> and how these factors um, 
are combined together uh, when, measure, me when measuring the seat interface pressure, both during uh, stationary and also propulsive condition. To do so, of course, they recruited uh, uh, wheelchair basketball um, players. The protocol was uh, uh, divided into to the assessment was uh, was performed in two different conditions: one static, so basically the pressure was uh, monitored and assessed and measured during a static condition, just uh, with the with the person just sitting on on the wheelchair, but also during a more dynamic condition during. Uh, a linear propulsion uh, in uh, in their co uh, in uh, in an inner court. The uh, equipment they used was a pressure mat, which can be considered um, a wearable sensor uh, in a, in a some sense, and also an inclinometer to uh, to measure the inclination of the trunk. Among the different parameters, they uh, look at the peak pressure index, so the highest value of pressure provided by the pressure mat, but also the peak pressure uh, gradient. So how the, the pressure is uh, changes um, over the entire surface of the, of the mat. And what they observed was that uh, personal, personal uh, athletes uh, characteristics do not correlate with both um, pressure indexes during both static and dynamic condition. But when looking at the different uh, changes in the, um, by, uh, by, by when looking at the different uh, wheelchair setup, they found that the seat dump angle and also the backrest height were um, highly associated with, uh, with the peak pressure measured by the pressure map and also <clears throat> the cushion type, because they use different type of cushions to measure whether um, a harder or software cushion type was changing, of course, the, the, the pressure. And they found that the gradient uh, of, the, of the pressure was uh, highly correlated with this type, uh, with the different types of cushion. <clears throat> and of course, finally, um, they found different types of correlation uh, with both static and dynamic uh, situation. So just to conclude, uh, they found that the authors uh, found that the use of therapeutic uh, cushion, which is software, and a reduced seat dump and the backrest height um, reduces uh, the peak uh, pressure, but also uh, the peak gradient. And therefore, they are suggested to, um, to be used in order to optimize the load distribution uh, um, over the, the, the seat. And also, they found that higher classification status was uh, classification status. Uh, so the different the athletes were, of course, classified according to their level of impairment into different sports classes. And these different sports classes were, um, were not uh, associated with uh, different with changes in the peak pressure and uh, peak uh, gradient, peak pressure, peak pressure gradient. And, uh, but something very interesting they also reported was that these athletes, uh, or at least the, the, the pressure that were observed in these athletes um, actually exceed the, the pressure that are usually um, um, associated with uh, the development of pressure ulcer by 300 to 400%. So the suggestion they provided to the athletes and to the coaches is that um, they should perform uh, during uh, their uh, sports activity some different types of weight shifts in order to alleviate uh, the pressure and the gradients, uh, especially during the periods of inactivities. So, for example, when uh, during the games, uh, during timeouts, um, to to take advantage of this time period uh, to elevate the pressure and the gradients between the buttocks of of the athletes and the and the and the seat of the wheelchair. So, very fast. The last example I want to uh, to share with you uh, was a study that uh, investigated how changes into uh, the different uh, properties and um, 
properties, yes, a customization of the wheelchair can lead to changes into, into performance. So how, therefore, the, the main aim was, of course, how we can customize and change the equipment in order to optimize uh, the, the performance. Again, of course, uh, the participants were um, athletes and uh, specifically wheelchair rugby athletes. They performed uh, different types of uh, dynamic tests, uh, so sprints uh, or other agility tests in uh, nine different setups. So they changed, uh, they used first the personal, uh, the, the, the setup which was personal to the athletes, and then they also increased or decreased the seat angle, the depth, the height, and the tire pressure uh, in order to see how these different uh, wheelchair configuration affect uh, the, the, the performance. In this study, uh, again, uh, the, the sensors that were used were initial sensors, uh, one um, used for each wheel and one on the front footplate. And also they used uh, a video during the sprints to assess and to monitor the movement, uh, the wheelchair propulsion movement. Among the parameters, of course, we, 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 had, uh, we have different types of performance related parameters. So for example, time, but also different types of mobility measures. So for example, mean or speed uh, or peak uh, speed, uh, rotational velocity, and acceleration, which were obtained through uh, inertial sensor, and also contact and release angle, uh, which were obtained uh, through the video. So um, the authors decided to, to report the results uh, um, adopting a case study approach. So here in this spider plot, we can see how uh, different uh, um, types of configuration so the different colors uh, stand for the different types of configuration uh, can change um, can change the different performance measurements. So, for example, the speed, but also the peak magnitude of uh, of the acceleration during the different uh, the first uh, sprint uh, pushes, but also sprint time, uh, agility time, and other performance related variables. And uh, here we can see that, for example, by decreasing the, set, the seat depth, there was an increase in most of the performance-related parameters, but also when, when decreasing the seat angles, we observed a similar trend of uh, improvement into, to, uh, in uh, the different performance-related uh, uh, parameters. A different thing uh, was more chaotic for the changes in seat height and the tire pressure. But again, we can see how uh, the different uh, uh, changes into the configuration of the seat height or the tire pressure can lead to changes into performance related uh, variables. And again, here they also had by looking at the video, they were able to uh, see the contact uh, time uh, um, over the wheel during the pushes and how it changes by uh, changing the, the configuration. So by decreasing or increasing the different uh, um, factors, so the seat height, the seat depth, or the angle, the tire pressure. So just uh, to conclude, um, the tire pressure and the seat height uh, depth and angle where, um, uh, where the, the factors that can uh, modulate the wheelchair propulsion during uh, the different types of uh, dynamic tests. And therefore, they should be taken into uh, account when, uh, when customizing the equipment uh, according to the athlete's needs. But also, these, uh, the analysis of the different types of performance-related uh, uh, parameters uh, is, was found to be quite helpful in selecting the right type of setting for each type of parameter um, in order to improve the athlete's performance. And, uh, but of course, in order to obtain a real, a real gain in, uh, in uh, sports performance uh, and in order to select a near optimal setup uh, for the athletes, uh, they should, of course, uh, do a familiarization period 
uh, in order to have uh, to observe and uh, to observe changes in performance. And during this familiarization period, uh, wearable sensors such as inertial sensors that can be very useful to monitor the improvement in, uh, in performance. So just uh, to conclude uh, this presentation with some uh, take home messages. Um, first, first of all, um, different type of wearable sensor can provide or can represent a promising opportunity to assess in a quantitative way the, the, the functional capacity of the, of the athletes with disability in a more ecological environment compared to laboratory-based measurements. Of course, application of uh, wearables in sports performance characterization for training optimization were similar to uh, those observed in uh, non-disabled athletes, but we can uh, see and we can observe uh, some more um, specific uh, application for athletes with disability in the use of, uh, of uh, wearable sensors, uh, which were the ones I showed you today. And uh, of course, among these types of different types of application, we, uh, we can find, find that, uh, we can say that wearable system and sensors uh, are very useful uh, uh, to support uh, the customization of the assistive te technology. So for example, we're changing the setup of the wheelchair and they can provide very useful information uh, that can be used in order to meet the athlete's uh, individual needs, not only in the field, but also out the field. So we can use these sensors not only to measure what is performed within the field, but also uh, when, uh, when the athlete is outside the field, outside the game during the daily activities. And uh, of course we can, uh, since we, we can use this information not only within uh, uh, the sports context and the Paralympic sports context, uh, but also in the daily life context, we can export and implement the information provided by this technology uh, and translate it into the rehabilitation uh, route um, of, the, of the person with disability, just exploiting uh, their ability to measure practically everywhere the movement of the person directly when uh, when it is needed. So with this, I finished my presentation. I thank you all for your attention and I, I'm here to answer to all your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rome. That was really interesting to me as somebody that has very little um, background in technology and the the biomechanics of our the way our body works. Um, it's really intriguing to me to see how you can use those for a variety of different things that I had never thought about before. But I had seen a lot of those different kinds of wearable technologies. Um, but I like the idea of using those um, to inform practice and to you know, prevent um, injuries. So there are a few questions. And um, if anybody has any questions along the way, um, enter them in the chat or um, feel free to, to raise your hand or unmute. I have one here uh, from Dr. Cottrell. Um, she is at the conference, so it's a little bit loud in the background. Um, so it says, thank you for an interesting pr presentation, Dr. Rum. In your opinion, what is the future of the devices and techniques you've used in your research? For instance, do you see use of these techniques beyond Paralympic sports, et cetera, different age groups, things like that? Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Let, let's say that Paralympic sports, it, it's uh, one, one context in which we can apply or we, we, we can use these type of sensors. But most of the time, I would say that uh, they are used in the clinical practice. So, for example, we can uh, um, use in the same way we can use the inertial sensors to monitor 
um, the movement of the motion of the of the wheelchair during sports activity. Um, so in in the field, we can do the same with uh, with with in the daily life. In the daily in the daily life, it's like uh, the steps count in the, uh, the activity tracker of uh, most people uh, nowadays use. And um, so, for example, we and a very nice, especially for wheelchair user, uh, a very nice aspect to 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 address by using the these type of wearables is the symmetry in the motion, which of course uh, these these people use uh, the arms to to propel the wheelchair during not only for those who are athletes but. Um, for those who are like common people who don't practice uh, sports, they use their arms every day uh, to, to move around. So we can uh, exploit the, the, these type of wearables to monitor the activity of this person, because most of the time the level of activity and the level of movement is related to, as I said, to, to injuries, to risk of injuries. So we can, uh, like use it in the daily practice, for example, in the clinical context to see how uh, the patient uh, is improving, is not improving, or maybe is uh, performing a movement that is uh, risky or can lead to like over, if it is repeated over time, it can lead to, to injury. So definitely I will, uh, they are already used in clinical practice, not only in the, in the sports, in Paralympic sports practice. Great. Another question um, that came in was um, similar to that, but how, um, how maybe you are using this already, but maybe um, not. So how could this research um, be continued at, to, be filtered down to the local level um, so that there could be recommendations for sports protocols um, because not everyone is a, a Paralympic athlete, but there's a lot of athletes out there um, participating in sports programming. So how can we get the word out to them on some of the, the findings that you've had and some of the recommendations um, that you have for injury prevention? Uh, well, read uh, scientific research first, <laughs> or at least uh, the, the, the research which is uh, available online. But from my uh, perspective as a researcher, um, and I, I have to sadly say that there is no big fundings for this type of research, especially sports uh, related research and uh, um, more specifically um, Paralympic. Uh, sports research. So um, really, the is there are some centers around Europe, at least as far as I know, because of course I'm uh, in Italy and uh, I, I'm more in my my knowledge. It's graded in, uh, in European countries, and I know that there are some uh, uh, research team research teams which are uh, working on, uh, on different types of sports. As I said during the presentation, the most uh, knowledge is within uh, wheelchair-based uh, team sports. And very few research has been performed in, uh, in different sports. We do have a lot of uh, research and, um, and scientific knowledge in, uh, in uh, Paralympic uh, athletics also and swimming. But still, um, yeah, the, the main way is like to have a look at what has been done in the past, uh, especially in the research based. While the second, the second step will be like to contact the national federation of the different types of sports, sports discipline to, to gather the knowledge that you want to have. Because most of the time, uh, uh, they they are the ones they are the, the organization uh, which are in charge of uh, disseminating information and knowledge which is hopefully most of the time evidence based to the to the to the public. So I would say the the main uh, route um, is to 
contact or to connect with the national sports federation which can provide some uh, some like support thank you does anyone else have any questions that you would like to unmute and ask dr rum Okay, well, we are a few minutes over the hour, so I do uh, want to thank you, Dr. Rum, for, so much for joining us. We really appreciated this uh, very informative presentation, and as um, I mentioned before, we will be archiving this on our Grand Rounds website, and I know that um, there are a lot of students out there as well as professionals that were unable to participate today, but we're looking forward to watching it. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if you get some follow-up emails after this with uh, from those that uh, were unable to join today. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for uh, the invitation. Thank you very much. All right, and you have a good evening there. Yeah, yeah, you too. You thank know, you. Bye, everyone. Thank you for joining us today.